Hello, good afternoon, everyone. We're gonna get started if you wanna take your seats. Hope you've been enjoying the second day of the 2023 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference so far. My name is Tal, I'm a first year uh, MBA student at MIT Sloan, part of the organizing team for this weekend. So we're so excited that this panel is here finally in fruition and that you're all here to see it. Um, so I'd love to formally introduce this panel titled Start Your Engines, How Data is Fueling NASCAR's Strategy to Engage an Evolving Fan Base, Customer Base. Our panelists today are Steve Phelps, President of NASCAR, Jill Gregory, Executive Vice President and General Manager of Sonoma Raceway, Justin Marks, Founder and Owner of Trackhouse Entertainment Group. Uh, the panel today is moderated by Joe Pompliano, host of The Joe Pomp Show, entrepreneur and investor. To give you a sense of how we'll do this, it'll be about 45 minutes for the panel, and then we'll save about 10 minutes for Q&A. Please submit any questions on Twitter using the hashtag Future of NASCAR. It's up on the screens in case you forget it. And with that, Joe, I'll pass it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Tal. Um, I'm excited about this, guys. This is uh, something that when I was asked to do it, I was um, ecstatic about because selfishly, I'm a fan of motorsports and uh, talking to three individuals as yourself is, is uh, interesting to me. But also we've seen a resurgence, we'll call it a renaissance of motorsports in the United States specifically over the last few years. And I think specifically NASCAR is at the front of that and doing an incredible job uh, in a number of categories. And each of you represent one of those categories, right? From, from the organization, uh, from the tracks and the teams. So I think the easiest place to start is, Steve, if you want to give um, just a general overview of, of kind of where NASCAR is today um, and some headline numbers that maybe people don't know right now. Sure. Um, well, Joe, thank you for moderating. We appreciate it. Um, I think for us, to your point, Joe, um, we are in a, a, a really strong time for motorsports. Um, and I would say all motorsports in this country. You know, we are the leading motorsports. About 80% of all the viewing minutes of motorsports are NASCAR, uh, or NASCAR controlled entities. Um, I think for us, we've had a, the resurgence really comes with uh, a plan that we started to implement four or five years ago. Um, we were seeing growth in 2019, 2020 brought some significant challenges. Um, but for us, we'll get into 2020 and the extraordinary things that happen you know, later in the panel. But the growth of, of NASCAR over the last three years in particular, um, it's very rewarding to work there at this particular, work at NASCAR at this particular point. So we're seeing gains on television, so significant share gains over the last two years. So we are plus 24 in share growth, 14% um, in 2021, 10% last year. We started up plus two and plus nine the first two races of this year. Our digital and, and social engagement is off the charts at this particular point. Um, attendance is, is coming back at our facilities nicely at a sellout the first two events this year, the Daytona 500 and then out uh, in Southern California. So it's just, you can feel the, the momentum and the growth. Um, and I think the key to it all is we're doing things that are unexpected for NASCAR. Our stance on social justice, what we're doing with schedule variation. The first event of the year we had was at the LA Coliseum. So if you missed it, we built a racetrack inside the LA Coliseum, quarter mile racetrack, Unexpected. People would not expect anyone to build a, a quarter mile racetrack in that kind of facility. So we did that for the first time last year. We followed up, you know, in the second year. It's just a terrific way to have a data point or a proof point that shows something different. Uh, later this year, we're going to have our first ever street course uh, on the streets of Chicago. We're going to race on Lake Michigan around Buckingham Fountain. Um, and Grant Park, it's just gonna be an extraordinary show. So for us, it's doing things that are bold, doing things that are innovated, and doing things that are unexpected. Yeah, and, and off of that, Jill, I'd love to see if you can give some insight into kind of what's happening with these new fans, right? As, as a track operator, are you guys doing anything differently than you were previously? Are there enhancements made at the track for fan engagement? Just any insights there would be helpful. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that we have to constantly be um, increasing the fan experience right now. I think we, uh, for many years, the, we knew the fans just wanted to come and see the event, whatever the competition was, and call it a day. And I think post-pandemic, what we saw very early on was that people were just happy to be back. Fans just wanted to be out. Um, so we kind of were able to uh, check the box by putting on a good race and making sure they can get in and out of the facility. But now the bar has been raised. We are in um, intense competition for people's time and their dollars. And so it's not just about the race. It's about the spectacle. It's about the entertainment. It's the experience of the day. And we're using data a lot to figure out what that is. So we know that our core fans want something slightly different than what um, a new fan coming to the race for the first time is. The good news is they want to see good, hard racing and, and what Justin and his team uh, and the other teams do on the track. So that's kind of the universal. Um, but a core fan might want something different in terms of you know, where they sit, how, they, how we communicate to them, what amenities do they get, whereas a first-time fan doesn't know what they don't know, so it's our job to educate them. So we're doing a lot with data to try to figure out what each fan segment wants, but net-net is if we are not increasing our game or raising the bar each week, then they have a lot of other options, and we have to make sure that they, don't choose, they, that they choose to come to Sonoma versus all the other choices that they have. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating stuff. And um, Justin, you're the owner of Trackhouse Racing, and uh, it feels like you guys have already, in just a few years, built a brand around um, the image of, of Trackhouse, which wasn't previously done in NASCAR. Can you talk a little bit about the changes that NASCAR has made for that to be able to happen in such a short period of time? Yeah, well, I mean, really, Trackhouse exists because of this moment in time that NASCAR is in right now. Um, you know, this is, there's so much uh, exciting things happening for the future. NASCAR is, is more competitive and more compelling on the racetrack than it's ever been before. Uh, I think what you see on television and, and the product that we're giving the fans that you know, everybody's, you know, that NASCAR is giving the fans is something that's, um, that's really probably more compelling, I think, than, than any time in its history. And so for Trackhouse and for me, you know, I raced professionally for 20 years myself and, and I, I decided to get out of the race car as a competitor full time to seize this moment in our sport where I, I thought there was this tremendous opportunity for new blood from an ownership, from a team, from a brand standpoint to come in and kind of disrupt the status quo a little bit. And so from Trackhouse, you know, we, we, we really wanted to be a team that just looked different. And so, you know, fundamentally to that is really being one of the first teams in the sport to come in and, and not name it and brand it based on the owner or based on any, any kind of one person. It was more trying to create something that's a story and an idea. Because, you know, I looked at all the other stick and ball sports and, and went, you know, if you're a fan of, of the New York Yankees, you know, whether it's Aaron Judge coming and going or, you know, A-Rod or, you know, anybody that comes and goes, you're, you're a, a fan of that team because that what the Yankees are and what they mean to your city and what they mean to you and your family is deeper than any one person. It's part of an identity. We wanted to try to do that in NASCAR. And so Trackhouse, you know, when we did a deep exploration into what it was going to be, it was, it was the combination of us as competitors and race cars and, and the community and the engagement and, and the family, so to speak, that we're trying to build. And so that's track and house. And uh, it, it's proved to be successful so far. I mean, I, I think that, you know, fans want, you know, they've been, they've been fans of drivers for so long or fans of, of kind of the OEMs, you know, they were Chevy guy or Ford girl or whatever it is. But with track house, it's like, you know, it's young, it's different, deeply engaging with the fans, coming out with new, we, we, we look different, we talk about ourselves different, we're rooted in positivity and possibility, uh, and it's just resonated really well with the fans. So, so with this amazing moment in NASCAR of, of you know, great new races and you know, a hyper-competition uh, parody on the racetrack, it was a great time for, for Trackhouse to come in. And like you said, I mean, we're, we're two weeks into our, really our second year as a fully autonomous organization, and um, you know, I'm, I'm biased, but I think we've kind of taken the, the sport by storm a little bit and, and created a lot of great memorable moments in building our fan base. And so uh, we're really excited to be here. And I, I think, you know, we're a reflection of, of truly where the sport is right now and where it's going and what the possibility in the future is. I think, and Justin's being modest, his, his, he almost won the championship or his driver did, Ross Chastain and the team, the one team. Um, and then the other driver, Daniel Suarez, finished in the top 10. So a rookie season, if you will, as a two-car team, it, it, I think it speaks to the competitive nature of where NASCAR is t uh, today. So we had 19 different winners uh, this past year, 
parity's fantastic, right? Going to the racetrack not knowing who's going to win. I think for a lot, a lot of time you had the same eight or nine guys winning, um, and it's just not as uh, not as compelling. This new race car, um, it's called we call it the next gen car, debuted last year at the LA Coliseum, and it has put on terrific racing. And so the first three starts this year of the car, it, it doesn't. It, it's even more competitive. So we're excited about what the future. What are the, what are the changes to the car that makes it? more parity across the sport and, and gives people more of a, a chance at winning. So not to get into inside NASCAR kind of thing, but you kind of have to in order to do this. And then yeah. Jessica can talk about what it meant to him to come into the sport. So before the next gen car, um, what we would call the gen six car, the gen six car, essentially, if you wanted to, Justin wanted to come into the sport, he would need to partner with one of five teams that manufactured the cars. Um, they're also the people that he's competing against, right? So you can't control what costs. They can decide that it's going to cost you, you know, $18 million versus $12 million. And it was much, much harder to do that. This car, essentially, we RFP'd 47 different parts, 24 different vendors that everyone had the same common platform, and then you put the car together. So Justin is a new race team can come in, he puts his car together. It's, you know, it's not a kit car by any means, but it, you can put it together. If you're mechanically inclined, which I'm certainly not, I couldn't put it together. Maybe Justin can or Jill can, I know I can't. But people can put it together, that's the difference. And you control your own destiny. Doesn't mean you don't have affiliations with, with uh, manufacturers like Justin has with Chevy, but it was a fundamental change in how people come to race. And then the car itself, um, because you're not um, creating advantages for one team or another, they're kind of in a box. What you do inside the box is how you compete on the racetrack. And I think that's why it changed both the economic model, but it also changed the model for, for the competition. And so, uh, Justin, you Yeah, I mean, you know, it, being able to come into the sport and have a chance at being competitive was, was you know, almost impossible for someone like me, probably impossible for someone like me for, for decades leading up to this next gen car. When they announced that, that this was the platform they were going to and this is the car they were gonna to move to, that was the moment where I really started thinking seriously about, about making an entrance. And the way that I explain it to people is, you know, for so long, all, these, these teams all could drop tens of millions of dollars into engineering and research and development and manufacturing to create a race car that was proprietary to their intellectual property in the race team. And so these teams ended up being more manufacturing companies than they were sporting enterprises. And you know, so those, the, those, ownership, those owners and those enterprises that were really well capitalized or had access to a lot of capital and engineering resources typically were the teams that sort of week in and week out you just expected to be at the front. Well. Sometimes I compare it to, like, if you look at football, if every team was able to spend money and design a football specifically for their quarterback, for his hand shape, size, his throwing mechanics, all of that, and design their specific football, and you had some teams that had a lot more money and had a ball perfect for their quarterback, and some teams that didn't have enough money to engineer and say, hey, you know, you got what you got. Now we're all playing with the same ball. Everyone's got the exact same ball. So the shift went from how much money can we spend, how many resources from an engineering and manufacturing standpoint can we, can we bring to the table, and more to a people game. And so I looked at that and I went, you know, I can't compete with some of these guys on, on money or business connections, but I'll compete with them in building a workforce and building a culture and building a company that can execute really, really well. And that's where we have focused truly as Trackhouse because this car delivers that opportunity. So someone like me, 41 years old, the you know, biggest business I ever owned in the world before this was, in my life before this was, you know, 18 people and $2 million in revenue. And all of a sudden now we have 150 people there. So it was a pretty daunting thing for me to do, but I looked at that car and I believed in the possibility. And, and I think Trackhouse and what we've been able to do the last, you know, year, year, year and a half, it's a true testament to, um, how you know, sort of courageous and bold the vision of NASCAR has been and be able to introduce something like this. And it's a great proof of concept for them. And it's great for our business. So the next gen car is very much the reason why, why we're here competing. And, and NASCAR now is much more like, a, like another sport where it's about, about the athletes and about the people and about the execution. Yeah, it feels like some of these changes uh, have certainly happened more recently, but some of them were in place a few years ago and were accelerated by the pandemic, right? When everyone else was stopping or slowing down, 
um, NASCAR was speeding up in, in some essence, right? Steve, can you talk a little bit about, and then we'll move to the, the track and the team level too, about just how that happened, right? How, how, did, how did NASCAR speed up when everyone else was slowing down? Yeah, I think for us, um, 2020 was the, the single most important year in NASCAR's history other than its inception. So we're, this is our 75th season, so that's kind of a bold statement. But on March 13th, when we shut down for the pandemic, with honestly no idea when we were gonna get back to competing. Um, so that was Friday. Um, on Monday, that following Monday, I got together. Jill used to be NASCAR's CMO and head of content and communications and other things. Jill and myself and three others sat down and we mapped out a plan for how we were going to get back to be the first sport competing. And 71 days after we shut down, we did exactly that. We went to Darlington Raceway, which is one of the tracks that we own. And we competed in a, in a facility that had no fans. Um, and it was odd. And the just having a national anthem and then no cheering, no energy, nothing, was so bizarre. But I, it, I remember that day vividly and driving to the racetrack and the butterflies I had in my stomach, I got calls from other commissioners that were saying, hey, we actually, we're really rooting for you. You guys are leading the way, you're blazing the trail so we can all get back. And it's the first time I actually <laughs> felt that they were really rooting for us <laughs> as opposed to what they normally do. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, but it's, um, it was daunting, um, but it was important. But on that Monday, when we, sat as a group um, and had special permits that were given to us so we could drive the streets of Daytona Beach in case we got pulled over because we were essential personnel um, that was going to get the economy back um, in the greater Daytona Beach area. Um, it was something um, hard. So we got through with the competing without fans, then we were the first sport back four or five weeks later to competing with fans at our facilities. Um, that was really cool. But the, to me, the biggest part of 2020 wasn't coming back from the pandemic. The biggest thing that will change the face of the sport forever was the stance that NASCAR took on social justice. Um, after the death of George Floyd, um, you know, Jill, one of the other areas that she was overseeing was her diversity, equity, inclusion. And she pushed us forward to a place that was probably fairly uncomfortable. And the thing that made it so extraordinary is people's perception, and I'm sure there are people out there that have a perception of what NASCAR is, right? It's Southern, it's white, um, it is not welcoming. Those things are actually not true. Um, and so we had to prove to anyone who is not a, a NASCAR fan the only thing we can do to put you in our consideration set was to change your perception of this sport. And so our stance on social justice, which was built on action, wasn't built on words, and then what we've done since that day in our efforts of, of diversity, equity, inclusion, are so surprising to people based on what they believe the stereotypes are of the sport. So I think people would say, well, if NASCAR can do, can do it, can't anybody? Um, not really sure how that makes me feel, but, but it's true. And, and so, and we did that. And so I know that's a little odd, but I think people's perception of NASCAR was rooted in the Confederate flag. So we banned all Confederate flags at our facilities. And I think people said, well, what took you so long? Which, which is fair, um, but I think it was unexpected. Um, and I'll tell a story of one of our owners, in fact, our Daytona 500 winning owner, Brad Doherty used to play in the NBA. I called Brad to tell him that we were going to, to ban the Confederate flag. And I said, uh, hey, Brad, at 5 o'clock, we're going to announce, this is like 4.45, we're going to announce that we're banning the Confederate flag. Silence. And I'm like, Brad, did I lose you? Brad? And he choked out, not in my lifetime did I think this was going to happen. So this is a man who deeply loves our sport, that is a seven foot tall black man has a certain presence about him and to have him be so proud of where the sport was going, um, it, was, it was extraordinary. And, that, and we've seen the results, right? So 
Justin's minority partner is Pitbull. Um, Michael Jordan owns a team. I would say, but for what happened in, in June of 2020 and the efforts since then, they wouldn't be in NASCAR, right? And so you see it from a competitor standpoint, um, getting younger and more diverse, an ownership standpoint, getting younger and more diverse. Uh, and then it's equating to what's happening at the, at, the, at the racetrack. So our fans are becoming younger and more diverse. I mean, the growth of, of Hispanics alone is extraordinary on television. So it's one thing to say, hey, I'll consider NASCAR. It's another, can you actually drive results with the changes that have been made? And, and that's what we're doing. And so if you have, this is my plug, if you haven't been to a NASCAR race, come. You are welcome. Um, we are an inclusive place. We want you there. Um, and that's the change in NASCAR. And that's why, to me, it's just not the year 2020. It was the three-week period in June of 2020 that will forever change the face of NASCAR. Yeah, w one of the things that we were talking about before coming on stage was the idea that the, f the fan experience has changed over the last several years. Fans expect different things, uh, new fans certainly, but old fans would like to keep things the way they are, right? NASCAR fans of 40, 50 years want to maintain the relationship that they have with the sport. Um, but Jill, maybe this is best for you around the, the track operator side. Is there data or, or things you guys are looking at to enhance this experience, but also keep it the same for the regular fans and not upset people that are currently attending races? Yeah, I think that I would take a step back um, and say too that the reason, well, the data showed and why the story that Steve just told was so compelling is that we thought, and why it was a risky move um, to ban the Confederate flag is that based on data, based on what you said, Joe, where fans like it the way it always was, that that was a bold move, that we could risk alienating our core customer, if you will, by changing something that whether they were a proactive proponent of the flag or not, that that was just something that was at a NASCAR race. And we had to take a calculated risk to say, regardless of if those fans are going to be upset, this is something that we have to do to invest in the future of the sport. If we are going to get younger and more diverse, then we need to act like it. We need to do the things that are necessary and risk if some of those fans were not gonna come back, so be it, because in order to grow, we're gonna to have to fill that pipeline with new fans, and that was an important piece for us to do. So if you take a step further on what we're doing to use that same data to improve the fan experience, um, we talk about that all the time. We know exactly who has purchased a ticket, um, to our races, both in the past and you know, for the, an upcoming race. Um, so we know what they've liked to do before. We can dive into that a little bit, but we also proactively talk to them now on if they haven't purchased, what's going to make them purchase? And then what do they want to see at the race? And is, you know, some fans are gonna be about convenience or quiet. I mean, relatively speaking, it is a NASCAR race, so don't expect it to be too quiet, but do they want family zones? Do they want a place to escape from the race? And I think, you know, conventional wisdom and the data backed it up was, you know, a fan wants to sit down in their seat for four hours, watch every lap of every race and call it a day. That is not the case anymore. And it prob that doesn't matter if you're a core fan or a younger fan and a new fan. No one has the attention span to do that anymore. So we have to use the data to figure out other than the race itself, what is going to compel them to come? Is it going to be a food offering, the chance to meet a driver it, because they saw something else on television, a, a way that they can get to the track more easily? So there's all of these different data points, but it's up to us to slice and dice all of that data, take our core fan, give them more of what they want, and then deliver new experiences to that new fan. And what Steve talked about with the race at the Clash at the Coliseum or the Chicago Street Course, that all drives interest and those fans ideally are gonna to wanna to come to Sonoma. So when Steve said, hey, you're all invited to come to a race, uh, I'll make the personal invitation that you come <laughs> out to Sonoma. Um, but any kind of novelty and excitement around the schedule is just good for us and an individual racetrack because there are more fans interested in coming and then we can go talk to them. Uh, Justin's driver, Daniel Suarez, won our race last year and we had a huge amount of his fans just rushed the stage at Victory Lane. It was one of the best moments I think I've ever had um, in my sport. And I know for Justin, I'm sure um, he feels it even more. But 
we want to talk to those fans. We want to bring them back. We're about 99 days out, and Daniel Suarez's number is 99. We are talking to those fans um, that are a fan of Daniel Suarez and telling them right now that it's time to come buy your ticket to the race. So it's very one-to-one -one communication. It's using the data to do that. Yeah, I would add, too, on the data side. So we've got um, a bunch of our data people that are here. Um, the two most important things, if, if we have great, compelling racing, and we do, right, we need to have people come experience what that's going to be. So if you come and sample at the racetrack, you tend to be a, a fan for life. For us, the data is, first party data is critical to our success. And so the woman that heads up for us, her name is Carrie Gritton. Carrie came to me with a plan about, hey, this is what we need in order to be successful on the data side um, and building our data garage and then making sure it's, you know, they're as clean as possible and, and we can interact on a one-to-one -one basis with it. So she said, I need 12 people. I'm like, okay, you can have 12 people. Um, I need these resources. I need to hire Craft Analytics Group. Yes, yes, yes. We have to get better in data. If we have that data, we can move this sport forward. And the other compelling part, if the racing is so good, what does the content look like? And how are we gonna push that content to that race fan because we know who they are, we know what motivates them, we know what they want, we know their favorite driver and what the hot buttons are. If we're able to do that and scale that, which we are, then this sport's just gonna continue to rise. Um, it's, it's great to have momentum, it's great to be growing, but you have to keep going to Jill's point. You have to, the expectations of what the fans are at the racetrack are, they just continue to get better. Um, and, or stronger, and that if we are competing with stick and ball sports, and we are, or other entertainment, or music, or whatever that might be, you better have a compelling product, because when we, when we bring them for a first time to have them sample us, well, it, if the trial period is not very good, they're not gonna come back. We want them to come back, um, and that's why we're investing so much in that, in that fan experience. Yeah, data is obviously a key theme from the brand level to the tracks and so forth. Justin, are there any things that you guys look at? Obviously, there's a lot of data in racing and, yeah. and so forth, but um, when it comes to branding or fans and stuff like that, are there, are there data numbers you look at? I mean, fundamentally, our data uh, lives in the competition side of the company. I mean, we're, with this new car, where, where the sport is right now, it's not uncommon for all 36 of the race cars in qualifying to be separated by less than one second. And so the difference between starting first or starting 20th might come down to three-tenths of a second on that lap. And so that, that result comes from an incredible amount of data mining, data collection and data processing, data mining, and then ultimately get to, to a, a result in sort of what type of race car we bring to the racetrack. So on the competition side, it's, it's pretty incredible what we have. So, I mean, th there's a couple of per things that we look at. We look at tires. We look at the chassis. We look at the engine. We look at aerodynamics. So with our partners at General Motors, uh, we, they are compiling data uh, every week and sending it to us that we have to mine and run simulations through to ultimately determine on Thursday of every week what setup we're gonna, be on, we're gonna put on the car and take to the racetrack to give us the best opportunity to be successful. So for lo so long in this sport, so much of the development and the data collection was done in the real world. I mean, these teams would go and they rent racetracks on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and they'd go run 500 laps by themselves and they had sensors on the cars. We can't do that anymore. I mean, it just was getting to a place where it was just too excessive and uh, too expensive. And so now there's, there's sort of a moratorium on all, all team, team testing. So we have to do all of that data collection in the virtual world. So from our partners at, at Chevrolet and at Goodyear, you know, we get all kinds of data during the week. This is the, this is the type of asphalt we're racing on this weekend. This is the environmental um, elements. You know, how humid is it? How hot is it, is it gonna be? How long is the race? What's the tire build, the compound, the construction of the tire? We get that data set. We get a data set from shocks and suspension, uh, some of the uh, weight distribution from Chevrolet and what their recommendations are and what their spectrum of recommendations are for settings. We get that from Chevrolet. We get from Chevrolet a bunch of data on computational fluid dynamics, CFD, which is essentially our, our aerodynamic bucket. bucket. Say so this, is, this is sort of what we, what we think the optimum settings would be for uh, drag, for downforce, sort of like how the, how the air um, interacts with the body on the car. 
And then same thing with the engine. And so what we do is we get all this data, these recommendations, and we run them in our computer through simulations like thousands of times a week. And what that does is it spits out a result and says, we think your spring rate on the rear spring should be this. We think your body build should look like this. We want to skew this weekend to more downforce and less drag or vice versa. And then settings for you know, making sure that the tire sits on the ground the right way. I know I'm going down a super deep rabbit hole right here. But the point is, is that you know, that's, that's, that's tens of thousands of points of data every single week that we have to compile and put together. And then our intake team and our engineers look at it. And then they hand a sheet to our crew chiefs and say, this is how we think you should take the race car to the racetrack. Mind you, when we unload on Saturday, we have 15 minutes of practice, and then we go straight to qualifying. So it, it had better be right. And, and the, the pressure on those teams to take that data and put it in a spot where we can be competitive is, is it's a heavy, heavy lift. And, um, and I, I go sit with my data engineers, my aero guys, and they start explaining what they're going to do this weekend. And I go, OK, you got to stop. Yes, that's, that's all I can handle. But uh, it's a lot of data, and it's a really, really interesting exercise to go through. And it's why the result is the fact that now you've got a sport that's as competitive on the racetrack as it's ever been. Well, the other um, place I feel like I've seen a lot of the data come into play is fan consumption and, and what fans want ultimately. We were talking before about the schedule innovation and things you guys have done around that. Maybe speak a little more about how you guys are using it with fans, too. Yeah, so one of the things um, that we've done, again, that's really data centric is how are you going to make what is happening on the racetrack come to life, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about the car and what is happening with the car, to Justin's point about the setup and what's happening to make sure the racing is as competitive as possible, there's data that's coming off the car about, you know, speed, braking, all kinds of different pieces. Um, so we bought a, a um, a data uh, science company um, called Racing Insights, and they have, they're helping our broadcast partner, they're helping what happens on our own channels, like our digital channel, NASCAR.com, to create really cool, compelling things that kind of paint a picture for what's happening for, the, for that race fan, that they understand what's happening. So one of the things that, that happens during the playoffs, our playoffs are very competitive, and what happens, you start with 16 race teams, then it goes to, after three races, goes to 12, three more races goes to eight. After three more races, it, you, the four guys race for the championship. And while you're watching on NBC, you can actually see how they're changing in real time, right? So Justin's driver, um, Ross Jastain, um, in the final lap of the penultimate race of the season that would determine who was going to be in the championship in Phoenix. He knew, his crew chief knew, Justin knew that they needed two positions in order to, to, to move on into the championship race. And then what happened, Justin? Well, he, he went down the back stretch and said, how many do I need? And the crew chief said, I need two. And he laid his car up against the wall and never lifted and ripped the outside fence wide open, came around past six cars in the last lap, set the fastest lap in the history of the racetrack, <laughs> destroyed my race car, but got it through, uh, got us through the championship race. That piece of content's been viewed over 300 million times globally. It was a pretty, pretty wild moment. But without the data and, the, and be able to instantly real see time. where we're at in real time, this is a half mile track. This is a track that's got you know, 23 second laps or something. And, and we never knew Ross had that in his bag of trips, tricks, but uh, he radioed through and our crew chief knew exactly what we needed in the last corner. And he made a decision that will live in content history for our sport. It will. So it's, it, we will because we banned it. Because it, <laughs> now it's our mo <laughs> it's it's track house moment now. forever now. Yeah. It was, you know, and, and honestly, and we were criticized heavily for banning it. Um, safety, safety first. So they're there are some things that could have happened um, that um, wouldn't have had a good result. Yep. Thrilled he did it. But it didn't. Right? But it didn't, <laughs> yeah. So those, the fun police came out, and, uh, or the not fun police, and, and took it away. But, um, but the data for us is critical, right? Data on the competition side that allows for competitive racing. Data it, from a data garage standpoint of what is happening to to create that one-to-one -one relationships, understanding who that fan is, and then data that allows us to put something compelling to the race fan that as they're watching or consuming or engaging with the sport, makes it, makes it more fun for them, right? That they, they want to stay and that it's sticky. Um, that's what data does for us.
one thing I'll add too from the team standpoint is, you know, I just hired a, a CMO and we're building sort of our, our media and marketing and brand development division. And, and one of the exercises that they have, you know, we're trying to create a lot of new and compelling content, um, you know, compelling storytelling for the fans on our social channels. And then we did a complete redesign of our website where we've got original articles and original content. So we track now that we're starting to put a lot of sort of our stories out there and, and interacting with, you know, other other. Uh, notable people in our ecosystem and and generating this content we're, we're testing all that through like Google Analytics and just to figure out you know what what is the stickiest with the fans when they click through to our websites or on socials how long are they staying in certain content stories versus other content stories and it starts to paint a picture as to what the fan wants to know about Trackhouse mm -hmm. are they more interested in you know the driver stories are they interested in the technical side do they want you know, Frankie Muniz from Malcolm in the Middle, he was at the Daytona 500 and I did a walk and talk with him about how much he loves racing and how he got into racing. Maybe it's a story like that that doesn't really have anything to do with, with the race cars per se. So we're right now in the throes of looking at all of that and determining what it is that the fan wants to see and then capitalizing and building a team around that to be able to deploy it and sort of be at the forefront among the teams on that. Yeah, well, one of the things that's been interesting to see over the last few years is uh, there's like three buckets in my mind. It's, it's data, it's content, and distribution. And you have to figure out how to you know, use those to, to help each other and ultimately get more fans to view the sport. And the part that's fascinating to me is that each of you deal with that on an individual level, right? The, the league obviously is trying to get more fans in, the racetrack wants people to come to the race, and you want people to be fans of the team. Do any of you have any um, thoughts on kind of how that's evolved over the last few years? I know in sports in general, it feels like there's a new documentary out every week. It feels like people are, are trying different types of content. Uh, but, but it is powerful, obviously, otherwise people wouldn't be doing it. Yeah, I mean, for us, it's, um, it's sampling. You know, Jill talked about being, getting younger and more diverse, which is something that she used as a mantra for, you know, 10 years. Um, it was hard to do that, um, and we needed a flashpoint, and the flashpoint was, was June of 2020, to create something new. We have to meet that fan where that fan is, and if that's through you know, some type of you know, docu-series, um, follow doc, whatever it might be. Um, you know, Drive to Survive has done a, a lot for Formula One. We had a, we had a, a docu-series last year that um, followed um, NASCAR for, for a year and you know, Just, Justin was in it and um, his drivers were in it. And it was, it's compelling because it shows the drivers without their helmets. The hard thing about our drivers is you can't see emotion while they're in the car. Um, you can only get that when they get out of the car. And to follow them outside of the racetrack and the compelling storylines that exist, that's what that does for us. And so we need to find different places to have them, to meet them where they are. And that's what we're doing. And the data will allow us to continue to do that and have them understand. But um, we, uh, as I said, we had a our version of Drive to Survive was on, was on USA. I think the difficulty for that particular show, which was really compelling, is it was 10 o'clock on a Thursday night. Well, Amazon had Thursday night football and did a tremendous job with reaching fans. Um, and so those that watch the documentary that we had loved it. Um, we just didn't have, the distribution wasn't ideal, right? So we're in, right now in discussions with some folks that would allow us to create a stronger distribution point that isn't set in time, right? Particularly if, it's, if you're not sports or you're not news, you can time shift all day long with whatever the entertainment component is that you want to watch. Um, and that's why entertainment has struggled so much on linear television because I may not want to watch Thursday at 10 o'clock, right? Because I, I want to watch the Thursday night football game. Maybe I want to watch it at 2 a.m., right? Mm -hmm. And that's where, if that's what your time is, that's what you need to do. So for us, making sure we have the right distribution partners, whether you're talking about racing, whether you're talking about um, other um, entertainment or inner content that you know, looks into your sport, that's what we need to do. Yeah. Jill, I'd love to know insight around, you, you've been around NASCAR for a long time now, working at both the league and brand level and also now a, a racetrack operator. Have you seen a shift in the last few years around the content and the type of media um, that's necessary to adapt to a, a larger but younger audience also? Absolutely. Excuse me. Um, 
And I think what we've talked about here on the stage so far has been this constant quest to figure out what they want and where they want it. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, traditionally you to market, you know, Justin talked about um, hiring a CMO to market NASCAR. You did a 30 second spot. You put ran it an institutional inventory on your key media partners with Fox and NBC. Mm -hmm. You hoped that they were watching it at the time that you ran it. Um, and you called it a day. And I think that, you know, obviously that's evolved significantly. Um, Tim Clark, who uh, is running all content at NASCAR, has been constantly um, challenging and recreating what we need to do. And it's not just about finding, um, you know, the fan when they're watching our race. We need to be, Steve mentioned it earlier, we need to be in front of that fan when they want it, in the form they want it, with the type of content that they want, and that's going to be different fan by fan. Obviously, we try to bucket it a little bit with new fans versus you know, um, core fans, but each fan's gonna want something different. They might want from a different driver, they might wanna hear more about the business, they might wanna hear, what was it, fluid dynamics or whatever yeah. you were talking about? There are fans that wanna know about that. Um, so it's a lot more complex to figure out what they want and deliver it to them, but we have to do it to stay competitive. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, I wanna move into the Q&A portion uh, because we actually got quite a lot of questions here. Okay. Um, so I wanna make sure we're able to get through as many as possible. The first one, they're bucketed in who they want to answer, but the first one's for anyone, so I'll let uh, whoever feels compelled to answer. The question is, in this new age of NASCAR, how much are the teams and racetracks talking together and to NASCAR as a whole, versus how much is siloed but with a shared goal? Well, I'll start. Um, that's, a, <laughs> that's a loaded question, but a really good question. I think you have to look at the, the makeup of our league, right? Because we are not a league. So stick and ball sports, they have a commissioner and they all have equity in this franchise system that they have. So the NFL has 32 teams and each of them have an equal vote. It's like the Senate, right? And Roger essentially is the CEO of, of, of that league. Um, they make decisions that are in the best interest of the league. So we have drivers, that are contracted by, you know, Justin contracts with his two drivers. He has a relationship with us, which is contractual. Um, we own racetracks, but one of the racetracks that we don't own is Jill's. So we have roughly half the racetracks we race at, we own as NASCAR, and half we don't. And so we have to contract with Jill. Um, we don't operate as a league. To me, it's important for us, if we are going to continue to have momentum and success, we need to act like a league. And that's a harder thing to, to do than say. Um, and it requires trust, it requires incentives for everyone to be successful. And so we have something called a charter system. Um, we have a, a media rights discussion that's going to happen. Um, and we're kind of in the throes of it right now. I think we're gonna have a tremendous result based on where the, where the sport is today. Um, we've got two great partners that Jill mentioned, Fox and NBC. There is a lot of interest from media companies and technology companies in NASCAR in attaining those rights, which is what you want, you know, kind of supply and demand. We also have to extend our charter. So how do we get to a place where the race teams are incented to want to push ticket, tickets to Jill's racetrack, right? It's important to do that. How do we get the drivers to feel compelled to, like some drivers are great and they'll do anything, like Daniel Suarez, perfect example. If Jill called Daniel and said, hey Daniel, I'd like for you to help with this particular promotion, he's like, okay Jill, that's, I'm happy to do that, right? Or Jill calls Justin, Justin's like, I'll help you out Jill, whatever you need, right? There's some that don't do that. We have to make sure that everyone is, you know, pulling on the rope in the same direction or rowing, whatever it is, right? We, we've got to do that if we're gonna to continue to be successful. We've got something special, and what is something special is our product itself. And if we do operate as a league, we're gonna be successful. 
Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, there, there's, there is a lot of discussion between the teams and, and NASCAR right now. It's, it's almost on a daily basis in a number of different areas and working groups and initiatives. And I, I haven't been here for that long, but what I'm gathering is that those discussions are probably deeper than they've been in a long time, maybe ever, uh, because I think everybody recognizes right now that, that you know, we're at this amazing point in our history where we're about to start a new a uh, new agreement with the media partners, and we've got a lot of momentum in the sport, new venues and everything, and you know, the teams are all you know, working very hard to, to build good businesses that have long-term viability too, and so those discussions happen all the time. I think ultimately, everybody wants to end up in the same place. Uh, it's just you have a lot of different personalities in the room, but I mean, it's a very passionate room, and, and people wanna see the sport be successful, they wanna see the teams be successful. Um, so, I mean, there's, there is, I'm on the phone with other teams every day. I communicate with people in NASCAR weekly, and it's just a lot of interesting things happening right now, so, so there's a lot of dialogue around it. Awesome. Um, okay, next question is for Jill. What advice or encouragement would you offer smaller venues with smaller budgets that don't get the top-tier races or celebrity appearances, but who would like to bring a more diverse audience to their tracks? Yeah, I think it's all about that fan communication we talked about. We actually work really closely with small tracks in our marketplace, um, and I think most tracks do. Um, that's the connectivity that fans have. That's what makes them love the sport. So just because you don't have a big driver appearance or a big media budget doesn't mean you can't still try to understand what your fan wants and give them more of it. It just might not be scaled as much. Um, there's a track not too far from us that they don't do this anymore, but it used to have 25 cent beer night, which is usually a bad idea at a racetrack. Um, but what kind of promotions and the kind of the old school promoting is what those smaller tracks have to do. So you don't have to have the big budgets, but you do need to have the intention to find out what your fans want, fans want and give it to them and not just open the ticket office and then hope they will show up. Yeah. Justin, what is the biggest challenge you didn't see coming as a team owner? Oof. Well, um, I probably just the dynamic of, of the sport among uh, the teams. I think just, just sort of the conversation, the, you know, um, I'm one of those people who came in a sport where I don't have, I never have any agendas or um, strategy. Like I'm just one of those guys that just shows up and like happy to be here, mm -hmm. and um, and that's how really like I built Trackhouse. But I mean, it's it's a very it's a very interesting uh, dynamic in the in the garage area because you've got new people like me, you've got some people, you know, teams and team owners and, and principals that have been there for a little bit of time, and then you've got a bunch that have been there for decades, you know, 40 or 50 years. And so the difference in perspective has been something that I, I didn't quite anticipate. Um, and, you know, honestly, other than that, like I, I spent, like I said, I spent 20 years as a, as a professional race car driver. So I, I have, even though I've only owned a team for two years, I've got, you know, 20 years of experience you know, at the racetrack, on the shop floors and everything. And, and so I, I came in this with a lot of, I think I sort of knew how it was gonna go. Um, but I mean, I think the constant challenge really in just, you know, internally making sure that our, our workforce is motivated, continually motivated. You know, we've got 100, almost 150 people that work for our company. So we've got 150 different perspectives on what the company is and what the sport is and, and what our, our opportunity is. And so I think it's been, it's been very tough for me to, to try to build continuity among those 150 perspectives. I think we've done a good job of it, um, but it's, it's, a, it's something that, I work at and the management team works at every single day. Um, so it's just those kinds of things that, that I, getting into, I'm like, great, we're gonna build great race cars, we're gonna go to the racetrack and we're gonna race super fast and then now we're spending a lot of time on stuff that doesn't really have, is equally important but doesn't have anything to do with race cars. It's been kind of an education for me. One of the follow-up questions was about your Project 91 program and uh, maybe you just explain a little bit about it yeah. but then how you think that impacts growing the team and, and the business that you're in? Well, I think this is a, this is a, a reflection of the opportunity that, that this car and the sport right now provides. NASCAR has been something that has been very unique in the world of motorsports. And people all over the world know about NASCAR and they're compelled by it. Other, other race car drivers and other racing series because America really is the only place in the world that we race stock cars at 190 miles an hour around high banked oval racetracks. But it's, it's, we're the only place really that does it. And so a lot of other forms of motorsports and drivers look at that and go, man, that, that just looks so interesting and so neat, I'd love to try it. For so long, you know, the cars have been 
very, very, up until next gen, they've been very proprietary cars, very, very difficult to drive. You had to have a very specific skill set to drive them, especially on the road courses when we get off the ovals and race on the road courses. Well, this new car, the next gen car, is mu the platform mechanically is much more consistent with race cars everywhere else in the world. We went to an independent rear suspension for the first time, a five-speed sequential gearbox for the first time. Um, it, it's it's the, the way the car handles, the way the car drives, a lot more consistent with other types of, of cars. So not to be too long-winded, but I saw that as an opportunity of going, well, now if, there's, if there are big stars of motorsports globally that want to come try NASCAR, that barrier of entry is lower than it's ever been. So Project 91, named after our car number, which is 91, was a small division in the company that we built out that could be the landing spot for global stars of motorsport to come and try NASCAR. And so we deployed that last year at Watkins Glen. We brought in uh, Kimi Raikkonen, who was the newly retired from Formula One, the 2007 world champion for Ferrari. Uh, he was here in NASCAR and tried it 11 or 12 years ago. So I convinced Kimi to come race for us in Project 91. It was, it was a great program. Uh, you know, we got excited sponsors behind it. It was very compelling with the fans I saw. I don't know how many Finland flags have traditionally flown at Watkins Glen, but I saw a lot driving in there, which was awesome. Uh, Project 91 is going to scale into more races this year, and so it's just an opportunity for us to internationally engage and to help drive more value for our partners by putting something on the racetrack that's unique for the fans and, and hopefully competitive and can contend to win. Gotcha. Steve, um, one of the questions here was about the auto industry moving towards more electric, becoming more electric over time. Uh, and the question was, how does NASCAR see this affecting its future? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we are working on a, um, a project with, with our OEMs to look at what a potential electric series would be. Um, we, think it's, we think it's a space that it may work, it may not work, but we think it's important that we get there and test it, right? So if you think about electric vehicles and whether it's Formula E or whatever it is, the, one of the most compelling things about coming to a NASCAR race is noise. And so what are you gonna do with an electric car and, and how does that work from a, a noise perspective? Are you gonna pipe in the noise? Are you gonna create something artificial? Um, but I think it's important for us to make sure that we're not trying to do, be all things to all people, but whether you're talking about sustainability, having a, a synthetic, you know, sustainable fuel, um, what your power plant is going to be. You're going to continue with in, internal combustion engines. You're going to go to a hybrid engine. Do you go to all electric, um, different body styles? Um, are you going to go to hydrogen? I mean, there are all kinds of different things that we are looking at, and it's important to do that because we don't know where the world is going, but if we are going to stay on the top of the, the motorsports heap um, here domestically and grow internationally, well, we better get it right. And, and it won't be wake up one day and it's like, hey, we missed it because we didn't do the testing necessary. We didn't create um, the opportunity to, to um, conform to where the world is going. And I think that's really important for us. And, so I, we are, I'm not sure I'm breaking this or not, but we are going to have an electric exhibition series um, probably as soon as next year. Um, and it will be kind of companion events. Um, and if you think about electric vehicles, they need to be either short, short tracks um, or road courses. So i um, not sure we're going to Jill's track, but um, it's important for us um, because we have to show that NASCAR is, um, it is becoming more green. I think sustainability is important. We brought in uh, a head of sustainability um, and she's doing some terrific work. And we're gonna have something that we'll announce um, shortly around, we're, we're doing a project right now over the last year to measure our carbon footprint. It's important for us to put plant a flag on the ground about when we are gonna be carbon neutral I don't have anything to, to, to say today because I don't know that. But over the next you know, month, month or two, we will have that. And then our industry is going to have the steps necessary in order to be carbon neutral. I'm not sure the person asking that question uh, knew they were going to get breaking news, but <laughs> that's, uh, that's a good one. I'm not sure it is. But just between it, us. Just between, yeah, yeah. between us. 
Um, okay, so the, there's a couple more left here. Jill, this one's for you. Uh, we talked a little bit about the idea of the fan experience and enhancing that fan experience. But someone's asking, in the age of inflation and rising ticket prices, how do you add value and improve the fan experience for fans? Yeah, so I think that um, you know one of the myth-busting um, things I can say here is that attending a NASCAR race is if not the most affordable, one of the most affordable um, major sports experiences out there. And we are being very aggressive in trying to package things up. Obviously, you want to keep your price integrity, but if we can do a package with Daniel Suarez and it's four tickets for $99 and there's a reason to do that, then you kind of keep your pricing um, solid. But, you know, it is expensive to come, and so it's, it's about adding those enhancements. You know, to be quite honest, one of the things that we have to get right first um, and our track's a little more challenging because we are uh, a road course, is connectivity at the racetrack. If we don't have Wi-Fi and the ability to transact at the track or communicate at the track, um, then we can't do some of those fan enhancements. So I think that fans are willing to pay if the experience is, is what they want. So part of that's going to be can they get in and out of the facility easier? After the pandemic, we went to digital tickets. We are kind of constantly in investing in new technology. But right now, without an arena where you can kind of cover um, your footprint with Wi-Fi capabilities, we have to put pockets of it around the facility. But that is all part of the enhancement that we have to do so that they can buy concessions more affordably. They can go get merchandise that the ticket price is more inclusive. Um, we're going to test something this year at Sonoma and you know the 49ers do it, um, and I'm sure a lot of the other um, sports teams, but in, in the Bay Area in particular, an all-you-can-eat package. And that's a little scary for our concessionaire, for some NASCAR fans, but you know they want ease of transacting at the track. Just give, scan my ticket and let me go enjoy my day. So that's never been done at our facility for sure. Uh, so those are the kind of add-ons and special you know, additions that we can make so that the ticket price, while it could be daunting, includes a lot more value other than instead of they buy the ticket and then they have to buy all of these other things to make their experience worthwhile. Yeah, and it seems like one of those things where you can look at the data, as we talked about before, yeah. and then you can learn from there. Absolutely. Yeah, so for us, um, like the Daytona 500, we had roughly 160,000 people. That facility has full Wi-Fi. Um, and so we were able to collect, I think, 20,000 new names that people were signing up for Wi-Fi um, that were new to our database, mm -hmm. um, which is huge. Um, but it really needs, to Jill's point, it needs to be about the fan experience. If you don't have the ability to take a video, take a picture, post to your social, I mean, or your phone doesn't work for heaven's sake, they'd be like, I, I gotta go, you know? Young people are like, I, I need to leave the facility. I, it's not working. Um, can't have that, right? It, it needs to be an immersive experience that allows you to tell the cool stories that you are building in the moment, as opposed to taking it and then, hey, I, when I get home, I'll, you know, I'll, you know, I'll upload it. And yeah, it's gone by then. It's gone. You missed it, right? Yeah. Okay. So this question is um, for Steve, but. I imagine Justin might have some insight too, given how he's building his team. The question is, the last full-time driver to ever race in the Winston Cup Series is retiring this year with Kevin Harvick leaving the sport. How can you maintain an audience that has seen so much driver turnover within the last 10 years? Yeah, I'll start. Um, it, it's a good question. Um, we were, from 2015, 2016, 2017, we lost arguably the sixth most popular drivers, Dale Arnold Jr., Jeff Gordon, Tony Stewart, Carl Edwards, Danica Patrick, gone um, in that period. What we've been able to do since then is take the Ross Chastains, the Daniel Suarez's, the Chase Elliott's, the Kyle Larson's, all who are young and three of the four are diverse um, that I've just mentioned. It's important to the growth of our sport. So. I think the coolest thing right now is that we've got first ballot Hall of Famers like a Kevin Harvick or a Kyle Busch that are competing with these young guys, and these young guys don't care, right? <laughs> the, the, the older guys are like, you got to race me respectfully. And they're like, I'm going to beat you. I don't care that you are going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. I'm here to race. You don't want to race hard, then you should probably get out of the car. Um, and so it, I think it's a really cool time because we'll be able to grow over the next... 15 years 
with this current group of young stars, and we've got a massive pipeline coming behind them. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I would add much to that, really. I mean, it's, it just kind of happens in all sports. There's star, stars, you know, turn over, but every time, a, every time a Hall of Famer or a veteran leaves, it opens up a seat in a race car for an entirely new person to come in, a new personality to engage with the fans, and a new, new talent to be able to write their history in the sport. So we have, a, we have a tremendous amount of talented and compelling kids that are, that are 19 to 25 years old that I think are going to do a great job carrying the sport forward. Yeah, it seems like NASCAR is in a really good spot now and, and potentially in the future, too. So thank you guys for doing this so much. I had a great time. I hope everyone else enjoyed it, too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.